The remainder of this day was by no means spent unhappily by the warm-hearted little heiress. The school mistress, mistress was made to expect Edward on the morrow, and the cook was made to expect Edward on the morrow. One Mercury was dispatched to the town for a choice collection of slates, copies, spelling books, and the like, and another to Mary's tailor in ordinary, with instructions to call on the widow Armstrong and to take measure of her son. All this business, and a good deal more tending the same way, having been satisfactorily got through in the course of the day that kept all the Ashley world safely entangled in the thickets of Blackberry Wood, Mary Brotherton lay down to rest and slept exceedingly well, though not urged hitherto by having shared in their pleasant fatigues. She rose the next morning with a sort of pleasant consciousness of increasing power to walk alone in this busy world, and gaily announced at breakfast to Miss, Mrs. Tremlett her purpose of immediately making a visit of speculation to Miss Gabberly in order to ascertain if any gossip was yet afloat respecting the disappearance of Sir Matthew Dowling's far-famed protégé. The distance from Mrs. Brother Miss Brotherton's mansion to Mrs. Gabberly's cottage was not great, and the heiress traversed it without having any fear of officers before her eyes, or any other protection than her parasol. She was, of course, received with expressions of unmitigated astonishment at her absence from the gala of the preceding day. "'What on earth, my dear child, could have kept you away?' said the animated lady. Perhaps I was afraid of taking cold, Miss Gabberly. Miss Tremlett took care I should remember how short the days are growing. Miss Tremlett, nonsense. Well, now, I can tell you, I can tell you that you just lost the most delightful day that anybody ever had. Such a dinner, games of all kinds, almost all in savory jelly, too. Think of that, so wholesome, you know, with the spice and the eating of it in the open air and all. Depend upon it, my dear Miss Brotherton, that if you suffer yourself to be boxed up by that ignorant old woman, you will very soon lose your health altogether. And do you know I can't help thinking that you do look rather feverish today. Your eyes have a sort of brightness. I wish to goodness you would let me feel your pulse. Nothing will do my pulse so much good, my dear Miss Gabberly, as you telling me all the news you heard yesterday, said the young lady, good-humouredly shaking the hand that was extended to ascertain her state of health. Well, now, my dear, I am sure I have no objection in the world to tell you, and certainly one does pick up a vast deal of information at such a party as that. Will you believe it? Two of the Simmonses are going to be married. Really, that's very good news, I suppose. Had you a great many people there? Oh, everybody, just everybody, but your own dear self. And I can truly say that if you had been there, it would have been quite perfect. You are very kind, but a person so much afraid of taking cold is always troublesome on these al fresco occasions. Lady Clarissa was there, of course. Of course, my dear, Su and such a flirtation with Sir Matthew. God knows, I ain't over strict in any way. I despise it because it shows such ignorance of life and good society. But I must say, I do think that they carry out the thing a little too far. Of course, a lady of rank and title like Lady Clarissa is not to be judged altogether like common people. I'm quite aware of that, and nothing could be more thoroughly vulgar than forgetting this. And I certainly have lived too much in the really first-rate good society not to know it. But nevertheless, you know, there is reason in roasting eggs, and even a earl's daughter may get talked of. Was Lady Dowling in presence? inquired Miss Brotherton, smiling. Oh, no, my dear. Thank God she was not, or we should have had sour looks with our sweetmeats, I can tell you. Did Sir Matthew bring you his favorite little, little favorite with him? That the little boy he has adopted, you know. Oh, dear, haven't you heard all that yet? Well, now, upon my word, Mary Brotherton, it will not do, you shutting yourself up in this way, catching cold indeed, as if I, the daughter of my own poor dear father, wasn't likely to know more than Miss Tremlett about catching cold. Why, my dear, the little boy has been sent away. I don't know how long was such a monstrous premium paid by Sir Matthew to get him entered at one of those first commercial houses in Europe. Dr. Crockley was exceedingly agreeable and attentive to me all day yesterday, and indeed so he was, I must say, to everybody. We do sometimes differ about spinal complaints, and I think he is a great deal too speculative. But it is impossible to deny that he can be very agreeable when he chooses it, and it was he that told me about this last noble act of Sir Matthew, 
To be sure, he is an honour to the country, if there ever was one, Sir Matthew, I mean. It is such men as that, Miss Brotherton, that brings wealth and prosperity to our glorious country. To think only of the hand, his hands he employs, fifteen hundred children t taking all his mills together, he told us yesterday, besides several men and women. Oh, it is glorious to be sure. However, Dr. Crockley did just whisper to me, but I don't believe he meant it should go much farther. He did certainly hint that poor cross Lady Dowling did not like to have the little fellow in the house, and that was one reason why Sir Matthew was in such a hurry to place him. Did you happen to hear what part of the country the little boy had been sent, Miss Gabberly? Why, no, my dear, I can't say I did. But that makes no difference, you know. Everybody is aware that it is a noble situation for him, and that's the main point, of course. Oh, uh, certainly. I asked only from idle curiosity, and I suppose, Miss Gabberly, that is because I am so idle that I often feel curious about things nobody else seems to care about. Do you know that I am dying to get into a factory and see all those dear little children at work? It must be so pretty to see them all looking so proud and so happy, and all enjoying themselves so much. I really must get a peep at it, said Miss Brotherington. Law, my dear, what a queer, queer notion, replied Miss Gab Mrs. Gabberly. Perhaps it is, said Mary, smiling, as nobody else in the whole neighborhood ever talks about it. But if I have such a fancy, there can be no reason why I should not indulge it, can there? Why, good gracious, my dear child, only think of the dirt. You would be downright poisoned, my... Poisoned, Mary. Poisoned? How can that be, my dear Miss Gabberly? When everybody, when everybody agrees... And it is such a blessing to the country to have brought such multitudes of children to work together in these factories. Nonsense, my dear, Miss Gabberly said, Miss, replied Miss Gabberly, knitting her brows. This is some of Miss Tremblett's vulgar in ignorance, I am very sure. How can a girl of your good understanding, Miss Brotherton, speak as if what was good and proper for the working classes had anything to do with such as you? Fie, my dear! Pray never let anybody in the neighborhood hear you talk in this strange, wild way. I do assure you that there is nothing no, there is nothing that would do you so much injury in the opinion of all the first families hereabouts, and nobody knows this neighborhood better than I do. I am quite aware of that, Miss Gabberly, said the young woman very respectfully, and that is one reason why I wish to talk to you about this notion of mine. Is it really true, Miss Gabberly, that none of the ladies in the neighborhood ever go to the factories? To be sure. Why should they go, for goodness sakes? Oh, I don't know exactly, but I cannot see why they should not, if they wish it, replied Miss Brotherton modestly. Well, now, but I do, my dear. I do beg and entreat, entreat that you won't talk any more about it. I am quite sure, Mary, that somebody or the other has been talking nonsense to you about all of this. If you had got any friends or connections towards Fairly now, I should think that they had been telling you all the romantic stuff that, that has been hatching there about factory children, and God knows what besides. But I don't believe you have ever gone visiting that way, have you, my dear? And who is there at Fairley, my dear Miss Gabberly, who would likely to be talked to me on such a subject? said Mary, colouring at the temples, with eagerness, e eagerness to hear the answer. Good gracious, my dear, did you never hear tell of that poor wrong headed clergyman, George Bell? Such a different to be difference to be sure between one man and another. My dear Mr. Gabberly never in his life breathed a word that could hurt the feelings of his neighbors. He visited them every one and was on the best and most friendly terms with them all, which is what I call living in the true spirit of Christian charity. Whereas this tiresome, troublesome Mr. Bell has taken in his head to find out, find out wrong, where everybody else sees nothing but right. And God forbid, my dear, that you should take it into your dear, dear innocent head to follow any of his mischievous fancies. I wonder what he'll be get. He'll, he'll get by it. Great goose! He must be, to be sure, not to see that he is going exactly the way to. <laughs> Great goose, he must be, to be sure, not to see that he is going exactly the way to set everybody that can be of the least use to him smack against him in all things. What is it that he does, Mr. Mrs. Gabberly, that is so very wrong? demanded Miss Brotherton. What is it he does? Why, just everything he ought not to do, my dear, that's all. You would hardly believe, perhaps, that a clergyman should actually encourage the poor to complain of the very labor by which they live. 
and yet I give you my word and honor that that is exactly what he's been doing. It's incredible, isn't it? Almost. He positively says, loud enough for all the country to hear him, that the labor in the factories, such a blessing as it is to the poor, he actually says that it is bad for the children's health. Such stuff, you know, as if, as if the medical man does not know best. And there's numbers of them that declares it's quite impossible to tell in any way satisfactory that it can do him any harm at all. And, upon my word, I don't know what poor people will come to. It's quite out of the question to attempt pleasing them. If they've got no work, they're perfectly outrageous that, about that, and ready to tear people, people to pieces just to get it. And no sooner than there's enough to do, than away they go bawling again, swearing that the children are overworked. Isn't it provoking, my dear? Mr. George Bell, said Mary very distinctly. Yes, my dear, that's the name of the foolish man who seems to take a pleasure in making people fancy they are not well enough off. Well, I'm sure, but by, I, by all I can hear and understand, that these very identical people may consider themselves first and foremost the, the whole world for prosperity, replied Mrs. Gabberly. Fairly? rejoined Miss Brotherton interrogatively. Yes, my dear, Fairly's where he lives, if I don't mistake. Good morning, Mrs. Gabberly, said the young lady, rising somewhat abruptly. I am very glad I ha you had such a pleasant day yesterday. Goodbye. And without permitting the stream of Miss Gabberly's eloquence to well, f well forth upon her afresh, the heiress slipped through the parlor door and escaped. <laughs>